But I'd be curious because if I was someone listening in, I know, Paul, you would say it's not a pure carnivorous diet if you do have a little bit of fiber and a little bit of vegetables. But if I'm listening to this and I hear, okay, well, it, fiber show, well, fiber apparently isn't necessarily absolutely necessary, right? Is it, it is what you're saying. But at the same time, why wouldn't I just go eat meat, go carnivorous, but also keep a little bit of diet, uh, fiber in my diet and not totally get rid of it? What would be the use of absolutely getting rid of all fiber whatsoever? Because, so this gets into the idea of a carnivorous diet, right? In order to eat a carnivorous diet, you're going to eliminate all you fiber. Have to, so, yes. And that's the idea that to understand what a carnivorous diet is, you have to do a carnivorous diet, right? A carnivorous diet is not eating meat and vegetables. And this gets into something which we haven't talked at all about, which is the large body of data around potentially toxic and uh, clearly toxic compounds in plants. So the idea around a carnivorous diet is that removing plants is a benefit because of all of the negative things in plants, all the toxins, all the uh, digestive enzyme inhibitors, et cetera, et cetera, which we should probably elaborate on. The removal of fiber is one of the side effects of that. And um, what we are illustrating over the last um, amount of time is the fact that in my perspective, the removal of fiber, not harmful in any way, shape or form um, for people and in some clinical conditions, quite helpful. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? It makes sense. So, I mean, then what about the, what are the toxic and dangerous effects of these, you know, some vegetables, et cetera, that you you haven't talked about yet. Like, is there, can we go deeper on that? Yeah, we can absolutely go deeper. And then on we can talk so, about toxic compounds in meat. I would love to talk about that. We should definitely talk about both. <laughs> we should talk about both. So um, I will note that before you cook it, Lane, meat doesn't have any toxic compounds that I'm aware of, but we can debate that. Okay, we'll debate sure. it. Heme we'll iron. Debate it. Well, let's talk about heme iron. I would love to talk about heme iron, but first let's They're talk about plants. But can be converted to a carcinogenic compound. Go ahead. Yep. Only in the context of calcium deficiency in rats and uh, N nitroso compounds from nitrates. But we'll talk about that. I think that heme iron is a fantastic thing for people who want to actually absorb iron and use it to make red blood cells so we can live. So let's talk about plant toxins, right? Let's talk about how toxic plants are. Now, the overarching perspective here is, I think, quite interesting from the perspective of evolution. Plants do not exist to feed humans. Plants have their own agenda. This is anthropomorphization, but indulge me. Plants exist to move their DNA forward evolutionarily. They do not exist to feed humans. Kale doesn't give a shit. How are animals different than that? The animals are completely, different, are completely the same as that, but plants are looking out for themselves. Plants can't move. They can't defend themselves. So what they have done is evolve myriad, myriad pesticides, and toxins to defend against rodents, insects, herbivores, and other people, or you know, humans, or whoever wants to eat them. Now, this list is long, it is exhaustive. The first thing I would do is refer people to an article from um, Bruce Ames, who uh, was actually Rhonda Patrick's mentor when she was in graduate school, I believe. And the title of this article is Dietary Pesticides 99.9% .9 All Natural. What Bruce Ames notes in this article is that plants have so many toxins that have never been characterized and that have either been shown to be uh, harmful in rodents or just never even looked at to be um, characterized in humans. And that the majority of what we take in in terms of pesticides are from plants. There are thousands. And if you look at the biochemical complexity of plants, it is incredible. It's just, it's overwhelming. There's a chart on the second page, 49 natural pesticides and metabolites found in cabbage, 49 molecules. How many of them are characterized in humans? Three. We don't even know what these molecules do. The idea is that plants are evolving chemicals which are meant to hurt animals which consume them or else the plant would get consumed. If this were Willy Wonka's chocolate factory and you could just run around eating whatever you want and it all tasted great and I guess the metaphor is breaking down because it all has sugar. But let me just finish the thought. I mean, if plants were like, you know, candy cane lollipops and you could just go eat them all. There would be no plants except on the earth, right? Plants have to be in this constant warfare with, with herbivores and with animals that eat them. And so plants have tons and tons of pesticides. They're not characterized. We don't know what they do. The first one on this list, let's just talk about this one because it goes back to what Lane was saying about sulforaphane, which I would love to talk about. Glucosinolates. This is in cabbage. So table, 49 natural pesticides uh, and metabolites found in cabbage. The first one is glucosinolates. 
glucosinolates are like glucoraphanin, which is the precursor to sulforaphane. So the way that sulforaphane gets made is when myrosinase in the plant combines with sulforaphane when the plant is chewed. Sulforaphane does not exist in plants in a native form because if we look at the biochemistry, it is too oxidatively active. Sulforaphane would cause oxidative damage to the plant and probably kill the plant um, if it were active in the plant. So it's in a glucoraphanin form, myrosinase activated. This is how glucosinolates work. They get activated by myrosinase in the chewing of the plant. This is an evolutionary mechanism saying, I'm a piece of kale, I'm a brassic vegetable, whether it's kale, uh, broccoli, uh, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, those are all hybridized. But basically the, the, you know, the oldest brassic vegetable, a plant is sitting there, an animal comes along and chews it, the myrosinase combines with the glucosinolate, and what do you get? You get an active plant pesticide, which is oxidatively active. We throw around these terms a lot, and I think as we get into these plant pesticides, we are going to get deep into this rabbit hole, so I'll explain this to people. There's oxidation and reduction. Loss of electrons is oxidation, gain of electrons is reduction. So we're talking about oxidation and reduction when we're talking about oxidative stress. We're talking about movement of electrons between molecules. There are many of these molecules which create oxidative stress, meaning they are transiting electrons around. That's basically what it's doing. Life is the movement of electrons. We're moving electron currency. And so what happens with these plant pesticides is that they are oxidative stressors. They go into our bodies and they provide oxidative stress. So forophane is a great example of this. It's been essentially hailed as like the greatest thing, right? Mount Patrick promotes it, but how does it work? There is a large misunderstanding that sulforaphane is used in human biochemistry somehow or gets into our circulation. None of those things happen. When we eat glucosinolates, whether it's sulforaphane or another glucoraphanin, uh, after it's been transformed by myrosinase, there's a number of them here on this page, those are immediately detoxified by the body. The body doesn't want these. We do not use these molecules in human biochemistry at all. We immediately detoxify them through phase one and phase two detoxification in the liver, and they are excreted. The only potential benefit to these compounds is hormesis, which is a philosophical idea that potentially a small amount of a toxin could result in increased uh, enzymatic systems like the NRF2 system and increased glutathione. So what's been shown around sulforaphane is that when you ingest some sulforaphane, you may get induction of NRF2 and you may get increased glutathione. Glutathione is an endogenous antioxidant. That is something we make on our own. So sulforaphane is not doing anything in the human body that we cannot do on our own. There are other things which can be hormetics and also increase glutathione. So sulforaphane has no unique mechanism and we know it has toxic effects. What are the toxic effects of the glucosinolates, for instance? They are scavengers of iodine. They're called goitrogens. If you eat enough broccoli sprouts, you will become, you can easily become iodine deficient. So there's this idea, like this is what the plant is doing. It wants to inhibit iodine absorption in your gut. It's gonna bind up the iodine. You're not gonna have enough. And the plant is preventing the animal from reproducing. So this is an example uh, that I'm illustrating around this. There are many of these compounds. This is just the glucosinolates. Also in the cabbage, cyanides, which gets into the cyanogenic glycosides, terpenes, and phenols, which have been shown to cause cancer in lab animals. So there are so many of these compounds in plants. And high doses. Absolutely. Have they been studied in humans? No. We don't even look at these in humans. We don't know what these are doing. We don't even know what these, this is my argument. We don't know what these plant molecules are doing to our DNA. They can be damaging our DNA. They can be causing excess oxidative stress. And I will show you a paper in which they removed plant uh, flavols, uh, flavonoids, and people had improved markers of oxidative stress. So the idea is that these plants can be creating too much oxidative stress at some level, if we believe in hormesis, which we will talk about further, hopefully, which is the idea that a small amount of a toxin could be beneficial by increasing glutathione, we can definitely get too much. You can definitely get too much sulforaphane. You can definitely get too much resveratrol. You can definitely get too much of these compounds. And the idea is like, if you can do all this on your own, and they're also inhibiting uh, the absorption of iodine, and we don't know what many of these compounds are doing, where is the net benefit of this? It's just not clear. There's never been a long-term study, and it's probably impossible to do, around, we could probably do it with sulforaphane, but all these other molecules and plants. But the idea evolutionarily is that these are not friendly pesticides. This is what plants are trying to do. They're trying to prevent us from eating them. So that's the overarching idea around plant pesticides. There are multiple other types of toxins in plants, which we can go into. Oxalates, phytic acid, tannins. There are um, so many of these, which can be harmful. There's phytoalexins, there's digestive enzyme inhibitors, cyanogenic glycosides, like I said. 
it's, it's huge. The list is huge. And there's some evidence that these can actually be directly harmful to humans. So the idea is that plants don't give a shit about humans. They're basically trying to kill anyone. Plants don't want you to eat them. They don't want us to eat them. They never want us to eat them. If we can tolerate them, which may be genetic variability between humans, then perhaps we can tolerate a small amount. But ultimately, the question is, is there any net benefit? I would argue no. And there's probably a net detriment, which is the idea around a carnivorous diet. How do you feel when you remove all the plants? How do you feel when you remove all of these anti-nutrients and toxic compounds? What do you think, Lane? I think all this discussion of feelings is so important. Um, well, I, I How think do you that, markers look. You know, I mean, let's. You want to? You want to? You want to? You want an objective endpoint? Sure. Let's. How's your insulin sensitivity? How's your neuroinflammation? Let's check your IL six. Let's check your microglial activation in your brain. Sure. Let's do all that. Okay. Feel um, your feelings, so, Lane. Feel your feelings. <laughs> sure. I'm happy to get my blood work done. Um, so. <laughs> First thing, it's a very interesting argument of um, a defense mechanism. I feel like it would, it would bear more weight if humankind wasn't not continuing to grow and prosper and reproduce uh, over the course of millennia. Uh, hang on, you had a really long diatribe, so let me let me do my thing. Um, animals, bro, don't want us to eat them either. So again. The animals care about themselves. And if you look at uh, animals that have effective defense systems that are involved in, be it poisoning or those sorts of things, it's a very quick response. Like you eat it and you die. Um, it's not something that, oh, ah, us plants, those, well, they ate me, but you know what? They're going to they're gonna stop eating us in about 70 years. Oh, oh, well, that didn't work. Maybe in 10,000 millennia, they'll be able to stop eating us because we're slowly, slowly poisoning them. That seems like a really poor evolutionary mechanism, to be honest with you. Um, so the other thing I would like to talk about is I spent a lot of time pointing out specific compounds in these plants that when you put them on Petri dishes or you put them in really high doses, you can cause problems. First off, that I know of, no pesticides have been able, no natural pesticides have been shown up in plants in amounts that actually cause problems in humans. Uh, but polyaromatic hydrocarbons, heterocyclic amines, Love and Hemeyer has all been shown to contribute to carcinogenesis. Love to talk so, about it. Again, now, God. I never thought I would have to take like a semi anti meat position. That's so weird. Um, so I'm, I don't want to say that meat is going to give you cancer. Um, I think if you eat a lot of charred meat, it's probably a really bad idea. I think if you eat meat cooked at high temperatures, it's a bad idea because they have increased formation of these products, uh, which have been shown that they do damage your DNA uh, and they contribute to carcinogenesis. And even in, you, you mentioned that, uh, Meat does not have, when it's uncooked, does not have any carcinogenic compounds in it. But that's not true if you consider the meta-analyses. Oh, my God, meta-analyses. Uh, <laughs> looking at uh, heme iron and the progression of cancer. Now, I want to be very clear. Heme iron is the most absorbable form of iron. That's a benefit. Okay? That's a check mark in the heme iron box. And I think one of the things I really try to emphasize to people is this very uncomfortable fact that here's my feelings i feel to be true that there probably isn't one best diet for everybody i know that's a crazy thing to say but there probably is if there's one day for heart disease it might be worse for cancer if there's one diet that's better for uh diverticulitis it might be worse for heart disease we don't the fact is i would disagree with that what's that i would disagree with that Okay, well, you can. <laughs> so thinking that there's going to be one diet that's just going to fix all of our problems and be perfect for everything, I think is fool's errand. Um, do I think there are specific circumstances when an elimination diet, even, I don't I think you can get the benefits from, from carnivore by doing some other things as well, but sure. Do I think an all-meat diet can have some benefits? Sure. But you can't say that there's absolutely no downside to eating meat. Because that's just not true based on the data. 